believe none of what you hear and only half of what you see. Hello, friends, and welcome to None of What You Hear, a new true crime-adjacent podcast that tells the darker stories of pop culture, legend, and lore. Quite often, as it does today, the story will lead us to discussions of addiction and mental health struggles so many of us and our pop heroes have in common. And I always like to give you a gentle heads up when it does. Well, it's getting to be summertime once again, and you all know what that means. Barbecues, watermelon, running through sprinklers, and long afternoons poolside? Nope. As of the past few years, when I think of early summer, I think of Stranger Things. And in honor of the new installment of our favorite monster-dodging crew of upside-down-bound misfits, today I bring you a story of one of the most misunderstood alternative culture mascots Generation X ever blessed us with. A one-time Hollywood darling who couldn't stay out of her own way or esteem herself as high as pretty much the entire world did. At least for a time. You wake up with a start. And as Dreamland takes a few seconds to fade away, you're already dreading what will happen before you get back. As you get ready for the day, the jeers and taunts begin to bounce their way around your young brain. In place of what should be concerns over lessons and lunch plans, all you can do is anticipate what could possibly be picked apart and ridiculed about each item of clothing you discard into a growing pile. You feel hopeless and stuck, caged even. You have no place of safety or refuge and nobody to turn to. Even if you did break down and spill the beans about what you've been going through, it would make things oh so much worse. You didn't choose to be different. And deep down, you relish not even being comparable to the vultures circling, waiting for you to show any signs of weakness or exhaustion so they can dive for you and make their attack. And down the hall, you see your dread personified. The words that had been echoing in your mind are now audible. Witch. Hippie scum. Freak. And those are just the PG heckles. You decide to hold your head high this time and drop a quick snap back at your tormentors. And as Dreamland again fades away from your weary eyes, you find yourself in a hospital room. Someday things will be different. Winona Laura Horowitz was born in Winona, Minnesota in 1971. Her mother was a writer and filmmaker, and her father was an author, editor, and publisher, and an archivist for Timothy Leary, Winona's godfather. Friends of the family also included Beat Generation powerhouses Ellen Ginsberg and Lawrence Ferlinghetti as well as sci-fi author Philip K. Dick. Though the Horowitz family was mainly non-religious, Winona was informed at an early age that her heritage was Jewish, and that the bulk of her father's side of the family had been tragically exterminated in the Holocaust. Winona became obsessed with the devastating historical period from a young age, and developed fears and anxieties of looming Nazi attacks on her family, often sleeping on the floor outside her parents' bedroom out of foreboding. In Winona's early childhood, the family relocated from Minnesota to Elk, California to join communal living with the Rainbow Family. The Rainbow Family of Living Light is a typically nomadic group who holds gatherings in predetermined locations worldwide, which were inspired by the original Woodstock concert in 1969. Their expressed lack of structure, charismatic leadership, or pretext rules them out of the cult category. Though at a glance, many practices are indicative of the 60s and 70s counterculture anti-organizations, for reference and illustration. As with any assembly based on complete anarchy, there is also a dark side, often consisting of rampant drug use, assaults of all manner, and accidental death, especially in recent years, as the gatherings are open to a rough transient contingent by nature. As I mentioned, Rainbow prides itself on calculated ambiguity, rejection of structure, and non-organization. So it's difficult to tell how closely the nomadic yearly gatherings are related to the commune in California where Winona and her family spent part of her childhood. But signs point to the Elk Commune as a close cousin at least. The 300-acre property did not have any electricity and Winona developed a love of reading, particularly Salinger, in her childhood times on the commune. When she was 10, the family moved to the nearby town of Petaluma in Sonoma County, north of San Francisco. 
Being raised in the strictly hippie environment did not bode well for the skinny, wiry preteen who was often mistaken for a boy, and relentlessly bullied as a result of being so different. Near this time, Winona also began studying acting at the American Conservatory of Theater in nearby San Francisco. That same year, she nearly drowned and was rescued beachside without a pulse, resulting in a lifelong struggle with aquaphobia. Which all you science and pathology buffs out there will undoubtedly deduce is the fear of water. In spite of the scare and problems socializing in school, Winona's acting career got well underway, and she began taking small roles that eventually led to the landing of the lead character Lydia Dietz in the Tim Burton hit and cult classic Beetlejuice at 16 years old. It was around signing on to the role that she chose the stage name Ryder after Mitch Ryder, the pop singer who had a handful of hits in the 60s and 70s and who happened to be singing on a record playing in the background while she was on call with the studio. By all measures, Beetlejuice was a great acting experience working under the master of a quirky macabre and acting with stars like Gina Davis, Alec Baldwin, and Michael Keaton, which made the harsh re-entry back to public education decidedly difficult. Winona much later reminisced, I remember thinking, oh, it's like the number one movie. This is going to make things so great at school. But it made things worse. They called me a witch. She said the narrow-minded small-town mean girls would often throw Cheetos at her, and once she dared to arrive to classes in boys' clothes and she had her head slammed into a locker. She was then so savagely kicked and beaten she was in need of stitches and hospitalization. And then she, not the bullies, ended up getting expelled from the school. Years later, Ryder recalled to Harper's Bazaar, I went into a coffee shop in Petaluma and I ran into one of the girls who'd kicked me. She said, Winona, Winona, can I have your autograph? And I said, do you remember me? I went to Kenilworth. Remember how in seventh grade you beat up that kid? And she said, kind of. And I said, that was me. Go find yourself. But Winona didn't say find. But I do think it's kind of a fun one if you're trying to diss someone family style. Anyway. Such tumultuous school experiences would have her primed for one of her next breakout roles as Veronica Sawyer opposite Christian Slater in another offbeat dark classic of the impending angsty 90s called Heathers. Though she narrowly beat out Labyrinth's Jennifer Conley for the job over not too subtle protests from her agent, I'd add that the role would ruin her career. The black comedy of a high school Bonnie and Clyde was an instant cult classic and remains so. She next played 13-year-old bride and cousin of Jerry Lee Lewis in the rock and roll docudrama Great Balls of Fire. At the premiere of that movie, she met a dashing beau who would end up sweeping her off her feet and becoming her first everything, as she once put it, but namely love. The dashing man of Winona's dreams realized was none other than, yep, yep, Johnny Depp. And Winona Ryder would not only star with him in her next outing with Tim Burton in another legendary modern classic, Edward Scissorhands, she would also spend the next three years in a passionate romantic relationship with him. The Hollywood it couple of the day were engaged after dating about five months. Johnny even permanently branded his flesh to mark the engagement with a tattoo stating Winona forever. But unfortunately, the young romance was eventually dismantled by the unrelenting Hollywood hype and gossip machine. It's very hard to have a personal life in this town, Johnny once explained to the LA Times. My relationship with Winona, it was a mistake to be as open as we were. But I thought if we were honest, it would destroy that curiosity monster. Instead, it fed it, gave people license to feel they were a part of it. The final breakup with Johnny Depp left Winona Ryder devastated. She fell into a deep, depressive funk. And at one point, in a state of emotional darkness, she fell asleep with a lit cigarette, waking to her room in flames, but luckily with time to narrowly escape. After that scare, she checked herself into an inpatient psychiatric hospital for a short time. Despite her claims this was her only trip to the dark side, she did walk away with a lifelong depression and anxiety diagnosis that would show up again at stressful times, often in conjunction with torturous insomnia. She downplayed her days after the breakup when stating, I was embarrassingly dramatic at the time, but you have to remember I was only 19 years old. And Johnny eventually had his tattoo modified to read Wino forever, once explaining that sometimes people just have to process pain with humor. However, during the time Winona was with Johnny, she was also experiencing a meteoric rise to professional success, making a name and brand for herself as the poster child of all things 90s Generation X cool. 
She starred as a chain-smoking cabbie in Jim Jarmusch's Night on Earth, as the lead in the seminal 90s timepiece Reality Bites directed by Ben Stiller, as well as some period pieces that included The House of Spirits, Little Women, and How to Make an American Quilt. She also harnessed her Holocaust horrors to bring a noteworthy narration of Anne Frank's Diary of a Young Girl, which earned Winona a Grammy nomination. She worked with River Phoenix, Martin Scorsese, Daniel Day-Lewis, Anne Bancroft, and Meryl Streep to name a sparse few in the list of all-star film legends. But bridging the period piece with her 90s trendsetter status was her contribution to Francis Ford Coppola's adaptation of Bram Stoker's Dracula, starring Keanu Reeves and Anthony Hopkins as well as Gary Oldman in the title role. What should have been a golden opportunity became by all measures a distressing experience for Ryder save the development of what became a lifelong friendship with Keanu Reeves. She recalled an unfortunate revisitation of the bullying she'd experienced in her youth, but now from a very unlikely source in Francis Ford Coppola himself. She's said to have remembered that he'd often treat her in an abusive manner in order to draw certain desired performance nuances from the young actress. This included whispering scary things into her ear and at one point getting cast members to yell things at Winona to purposely make her cry. Keanu refused to join in on the questionable behavior and the two ended up growing quite close as the days, weeks, and months of grueling filming dragged on. Perhaps too close for the comfort of even their bond of camaraderie and friendship. The film required Winona's character of Mina and Keanu's Jonathan to be married in one particular scene. For authenticity, Coppola enlisted a real Romanian priest to conduct the marriage rites. The friends still joke that they're unsure of the true legal or religious binding that may have resulted from the very real ceremony between them, even if in character. Though the friendship between Winona and Keanu was and remains more of a relationship success than some of their romantic endeavors, one friendship that went spoiled very sour was Winona's with Gwyneth Paltrow. For a time, the two were inseparable, often spotted by fans and paparazzi at pretty much every Hollywood hotspot, club, and fashion show of the late 90s. However, when Gwyneth Paltrow accidentally stumbled upon a copy of the script for Shakespeare in Love at Winona Ryder's home during an afternoon hang and subsequently landed the role Winona had been up for, the two pretty much never spoke again. The film's success shot Gwyneth Paltrow into superstardom and was arguably her breakout role. Smells like betrayal to me. Gwyneth Paltrow once told Howard Stern, hand to God, that's an urban myth. But she also forgot she was in Spider-Man, so. Though the 1990s were primarily very kind to Winona's career, she was still wrestling with personal demons that sometimes presented themselves professionally. In 1997, Winona was ecstatic to star opposite one of her heroes, Sigourney Weaver, in the latest installment of the monumentally successful Alien science fiction franchise. The film would be called Alien Resurrection. Ryder's character required her to film some scenes underwater. Still carrying the core trauma of her near drowning years earlier, the series of scenes presented a huge difficulty and more than once had her in a panic attack. In order to capture the footage necessary for the film, she was forced to redo the scenes many times, each of which exacerbating her fears and becoming more and more difficult rather than satisfying the director and filmmakers. Eventually, she was also injured physically on the set, which compounded the already difficult undertaking. Despite box office success, Winona's alien resurrection performance was critically snubbed and jeered. Winona was also prescribed opioids to cope with the pain of the injuries sustained on the shoot. I couldn't find specifics on the exact injuries Winona suffered, but the psychological effects of the panic were obviously made much worse by her history and phobia of water. The consequences of her one-size-fits-all OxyContin treatment were all too clear and unfortunately not all too unfamiliar either. Winona Ryder became very dependent on the opioids she was prescribed. She tailspinned into a cycle of addiction that at one point had her filling over 35 prescriptions from at least 20 doctors under a litany of aliases. If there is a hell, I sometimes worry that it won't be hot enough for the Sackler family and their Purdue Pharma company for developing and producing and pushing their special brand of non-addictive painkillers to this day. The full scale of Winona's addiction wasn't brought to light until a particular low point we'll discuss when we come back. Anyone who knows Winona's story knows of the fall we're leading up to, but before we get there, we do have one more moment of mixed emotions to discuss. 
In 1999, Winona embarked on a passion project of sorts when she signed on to be the executive producer of the film Girl Interrupted. The movie was an adaptation of a memoir by a woman named Susanna Kaysen. Her story deals with her own psychological struggles and her time in an inpatient mental health facility. The story and project were very meaningful to Winona. A huge chance to bring mental health into the conversation with the help of an incredible ensemble cast including a young Elizabeth Moss, Jared Leto, Vanessa Redgrave, Whoopi Goldberg, Brittany Murphy, and of course Angelina Jolie whose role solidified her position as the angsty sarcastic counterpart to Winona's shy wallflower 90s alt-girl style both on screen and within the pop culture zeitgeist of the day. The story takes place under the umbrella of Vietnam War era 1960s America, when mental health was primarily a completely taboo subject. But Winona was very successful in bringing her own personal experience to the role, as were the rest of the now iconic cast in order to create not only a current feel for the movie, but to destigmatize and normalize the mental health conversation for families, classrooms, and peer groups across the country and perhaps around the world. Winona, as a result, became a spokesperson advancing the cause of mental health that paved the way to continue to expand the conversation, including the podcast you're listening to at this very moment at a minimum. However, Winona's finger on the pulse of mental health awareness certainly did not make her immune from her own personal struggles. And that all came to a head on December 12, 2001. Only a little over a year from receiving her own star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame and celebrating a high point of her career, her personal state was considerably less than jovial. Deep depression and addiction were steering the proverbial ship for Winona when she entered a Beverly Hills Saks Fifth Avenue and proceeded to meander around the store and fitting rooms, shoplifting around $5,500 worth of designer merchandise before she attempted to flee and was stopped just outside the door by an eager-to-pounce security who had been closely monitoring the caper from the eye in the sky the whole time. Initially, Winona tried to pawn it off, claiming that a director had put her up to the heist as research for a role, but this defense proved ineffective if not ill-advised. After a series of failed plea negotiations, Winona was eventually brought to trial. Her problems and shortcomings, from depression, anxiety, and insomnia, to her heroic efforts to obtain prescription medication were displayed as prominently as the Marc Jacobs cashmere sweater and Donna Karen sock she tried to make off with in the department store that day. When the humiliating experience was all said and done, Winona was convicted of grand theft, shoplifting, and vandalism, and ordered to repay Sachs over 6000 well above and beyond the value of the attempted theft, as well as about 4000 in state fees and 480 hours of community service. She did avoid a burglary charge in jail time. The quack medical treatment she was under was also exposed and dealt with in conjunction with her troubles. In the resulting come down on many levels, Winona decided to take a break from the limelight and performance. Around 2006, Winona, possibly out of giving in to the creative itch, began to ramp her acting career back up with a few small roles, working with Richard Linkletter of Dazed and Confused and Slacker fame, as well as reuniting with her Heather screenwriter, Daniel Waters. She would continue to recover professionally with roles in films like Black Swan, Stay Cool, The Iceman, and in a redemptive reunion with Tim Burton in the animated Frankenweenie. Even that momentum didn't exactly get her back to A-list graces, but that didn't necessarily seem to be the goal anyhow. What did give her at least a substantial boost back into relatively successful celebrity status was her participation in the Duffer Brothers' hit Netflix joint, Stranger Things. The role of perma-frazzled mom Joyce Byers has become an integral part of the Hawkins, Indiana story and has proven well beyond redemptive for the once Hollywood darling ingenue who unfortunately fell victim to her own self-destruction. One especially poetic moment that sticks out in my mind throughout my exploration of Winona Ryder's story is a vignette she painted in a 2020 interview in conjunction with the Girl Interrupted release. She tells the story of a late night drive around Los Angeles in the throes of a brutal bout of anxiety and insomnia. She said she was passing by a newsstand when she caught a glimpse of herself on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine. Winona cites this as a moment of clarity of sorts about her surface superstar status as someone with all the money and fame in the world but still just a human person with all too human feelings wandering alone in the dark at the mercy of her own demons. 
And that's just sometimes how it goes down. How many times have we found out about someone with crippling mental illness and everyone says they've never saw it coming? Hopefully it wasn't too late because as we know that stuff kills. Sometimes it's very easy to get in your own way, especially if you feel as though you aren't being heard. Or even worse, feel like you don't deserve to be heard. It's not about seeking attention as much as pleading for someone to pay attention. They say not to judge a book by its cover, but in cases like the ones we've seen on the show, I might even go as far as to say something like, don't judge a volcano by its scenic tree line. Sometimes the turmoil that simmers far below the surface will destroy the beautiful exterior and anything in its path if left unattended too long. Winona Ryder might tell you the same. And hers isn't the last or the darkest of these kind of stories we'll address. Friends, thanks for hearing my take on Winona's story and all the stories we have told or will tell on None of What You Hear. It's been inspirational to see Winona pick herself back up out of the pit. But as we've seen before, the farther the fall, the steeper the climb up can be. I drew from a plethorosaurus of online articles this time. And as I always like to mention, our stories serve their own purpose to entertain and humanize our pop heroes and the struggles many of us share in common with them. Not as pieces of journalism or historical record. If you find that you yourself are going through a particularly rough time with addiction and or mental illness, you can trust my first-hand knowledge that there is a caring ear out there. Many, in fact. And some can be found at the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Hotline at 1-800-662-HELP. I really do care, and I put those resources out not because I have to, but because I know what a huge step it is to speak about these things. And I hope you know that step will only lead you in one direction. Forward. But if you aren't in crisis and just looking to share or talk about something, anything you related to or noticed on this episode or any other, I'm always here at nowyouhearpod at gmail.com and at nowyouhearpod on Instagram and, for the time being, Twitter. So please feel free to reach out. Otherwise, I will talk at you in two weeks. But in the meantime, as always, believe none of what you hear and only half of what you see.